Welcome to the fifth of our 14th annual season of doing these archaeology cafes. So it's been uh, a long and uh, fun process and this year they're all on online. And it's given us an opportunity to share what we do here, um, our preservation archaeology mission um, with a, actually a wider audience than we've uh, often reached uh, in, in the past. So the fun thing is we've been finding out that there's quite a few things that we do that people aren't all that familiar with. So I'm glad you came, have come back tonight because I, I think uh, you might learn some new things to, uh, tonight. And we're uh, Linda Pierce and Stacy Ryan and I are here in our uh, downtown office in Tucson. And Tucson's the traditional uh, lands of the Tanatum nation and Dusty uh, is up in Sholo today, and he's actually an, an enrolled Lakota citizen from Rosebud, South Dakota. So we'll honor his traditional lands uh, tonight. And I encourage all of you to think about the uh, traditional lands of the place wherever you are tonight um, that were uh, the traditional lands of, of native peoples uh, in the past. Cafe Series is a sponsored event by the Smith Family Trust. So Stacy Ryan has a master's degree in anthropology from the University of Arizona. She's a preservation archeologist here at, at Archeology span Southwest. And she runs our cooperative agreement with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which you'll be hearing a good deal about tonight. And her partner in, in uh, tonight's presentation is Dusty Whiting. He's a retired special agent uh, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a commissioned law enforcement and game ranger and fire investigator at the White Mount Apache uh, tribe, and owner of Lone Ranger Resources, which is an organization company that uh, specializes in the mitigation of archaeological and cultural resource crime. Um, and in 2020, Dusty received the Avocational Archaeologist Award from the Governor's Archaeological um, Advisory Commission here in Arizona. So I'll let them take the show from here, uh, focusing on preservation archaeology's role in responding to archaeological resource crimes. Dusty and Stacy, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Let me get my screen up here. So thank you all for joining us tonight to hear about how we respond to archeological resource crime in the Southwest. I'm happy that my friend and colleague, Dusty Whiting can join us this evening from Sholo and you're going to hear from both of us multiple times during the webinar. Uh, we'll pass the virtual mic back and forth. And in about five minutes, uh, I'm going to launch a poll, like Bill said. It's not going to be hard, um, but I do want to hear from you. So be ready to answer on your device at home. But unfortunately, I don't have a prize. So with that, I'll start telling you about the work we've been doing um, the past couple of years. Uh, we started out in 2018 with a cooperative agreement with the Bureau of Indian Affairs Western Region Office. And our task was to provide ARPA assistance. And we work with a great team of experienced and dedicated people. And our mission is to end looting and vandalism on tribal lands. But before I tell you a little bit more about what we've been up to these past few years, I want to talk a little bit about the scope and the history of looting in the Southwest. When we talk about archeological resource crime, we're referring to the looting, vandalism, and trafficking of cultural items and human remains that are over 100 years of age. These acts are often a felony when they are committed on federal or tribal lands. Looting does occur at sites of with many cultural associations. But in the Southwest, Native American sites are especially vulnerable. <clears throat> we have remnants of structures and artifacts visible on our ground surface. And Native American cultural items are desired by many collectors and they really are a focal point in the black market trade. Looting, which is also referred to as theft, 
grave robbing, illicit excavations, alters a heritage site in such a way that it can never truly be restored. Perpetrators tend to target sensitive areas. They use probes to figure out where to dig. They destroy structures and they desecrate burials to steal funerary items, sometimes leaving behind the remains of children and adults scattered in the back dirt. And once a site is damaged, we lose a lot of information from an archeological perspective. We learn the ability to, uh, or we lose the ability to learn about how these people at this site lived in the past. But the problem goes even deeper than this. When we listen to our Native American colleagues, and when we listen to tribal citizens, we hear that these are not forgotten places. These places have cultural and spiritual value and they are a link to heritage and identity. So this is a great loss on so many levels. And these acts are stealing Native American heritage and stealing history from all of us. And the bottom line for the acts of this destruction is really greed and also the misguided belief that we have the right to help ourselves to somebody else's heritage. People also go to great lengths to try to steal petroglyphs and pictographs, rock carvings and paintings that we find on boulders and cliff walls and in rock shelters. They use chisels, rock saws, power tools, and any other means available to remove whole panels and sometimes they haul away entire boulders from sites. We also see a lot of other damage done to petroglyphs. Spray painted graffiti is common. Um, etched initials and dates are very common. And this example you see here on the right is um, somebody using a petroglyph panel for target practice. And unfortunately, we see that far too often. And it's really heart-wrenching to think about these special places on our landscape being removed forever and completely erased. Looting and grave robbing is a centuries old problem. And in the late 19th century, when people were out here exploring ancient dwellings in the Southwest, museums and private collectors began buying from artifact hunters, really driving up the market value of Native American cultural items. The value of antiquities continue to rise through the 20th century. And even now you can go on any online auction site usually and find some sort of artifact for sale. Of course, always with the claim that it was taken from private land. Ancient sites and burials are now protected by several federal and state laws. And one of these is the Archaeological Resources Protection Act of 1979, or ARPA. ARPA is a federal law that it strength, strengthened existing laws and it prohibits the damage, removal, or excavation of archaeological resources on tribal and Indian lands without a permit. And it also forbids the buying, selling, and trafficking of cultural items. ARPA imposes stiff fines up to $250,000, prison time, and equipment used in the violation such as backhoes or trucks can also, are also subject to forfeit. There's a lot of flexibility in this law. It allows for criminal and civil, and civil penalties. And it also provides tribes with restitution when the violation occurs on tribal lands. ARPA has been criticized because it does really only respond to the scientific value of archeological resources and not the cultural value. But even so, it is really our strongest tool to protect archeological resources. So I know that archeologists see this type of damage quite often. And now I'd like to hear from you. So I need to launch this poll. Let's see for a second. I'm gonna ask you two questions because I know there are a lot of non-archeologists in our audience. 
And I want to ask you, have you seen evidence of archaeological resource crime on public lands? And have you seen evidence of archaeological resource crime on tribal lands? And I'm going to leave this poll up for a bit longer. But it looks like people can see it and are responding. And since I can't see you, it's actually really nice to hear from you. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling and share results with you. And it looks like 79% of you have seen evidence of archeological resource crime on public lands. And 32% of you have seen evidence of archeological resource crime on tribal lands. So I think that this really speaks to the magnitude of the problem, but really quantifying the full scope of looting in the Southwest is difficult. The data are not compiled in one place for us to access. And I've read estimates of anywhere of up to 90% of in the Southwest have been vandalized. Um, a few decades ago, federal agencies reported that anywhere from 30% to 100% of sites with structural remains in the Four Corners region uh, were damaged. So that's a pretty big range. The members culture area in New Mexico has been hit particularly hard. And that is an example of the price of pottery on the antiquities trade resulting in the damage and obliteration of major villages in the Mimbres Valley and surrounding area. And an NPS, a National Park Service agent who served on an ARPA task force made this interesting comment um, that 90% of the Mimbres sites are on protected lands, 90% have been looted, yet 100% of what we investigate allegedly comes from private lands. And that is part of the issue. It's incredibly difficult to prove that an artifact came from tribal or federal lands. I do not know the rates of looting on tribal lands, but I do know that it continues to occur. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dusty so he can talk about this issue from a tribal ranger perspective. Thank you, Stacy. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for attending this session of the Archaeology Cafe with Stacy Ryan and I. I am Dusty Whiting, a game ranger for the White Mountain Apache tribe on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation in East Central Montana or Arizona. <laughs> you could tell I worked a lot of places. Um, I also have the honor of working as a consultant for Archaeology Southwest in their noble quest to eradicate looting and vandalism of cultural sites in the Indian country. And for those of you who have a mental image of the Arizona consisting entirely of the Great Sonoran Desert, I would encourage you to come and visit us here in the mountains and forests of East Central Arizona. My training and awareness of cultural resource crimes came back in 1998, many years before my active involvement in the current issues. Over the following decade, as a police officer and investigator with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, we did have the occasional ARPA violation or ARPA related incident, maybe once a year in each of our smaller jurisdictions. And these incidents were all handled locally, but mostly not handled because the tribal court generally has no criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. Non-Indians violating federal laws like the Archaeological Resources Protection Act or ARPA that Stacy mentioned come under the jurisdiction of the federal court, not the tribal court. In 2006, my assignments kind of came in a big circle in the Four Corners area after working Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico sites, I came back to Arizona and was assigned to work with the Fort Apache 
uh, Indian reservation with the White Mountain Apache tribe. Those are the same locations. That's the government name for the area and the tribe that resides here. In the summer of 2008, we had some ARPA violations here on the reservation, and I was not assigned as the primary investigator. I had a minor role or involvement, but that kind of brought me back in tune with what was going on. A number of years after I had taken the training to become aware of the process. And then the following year, I had a chance meeting with our local historic preservation officer and I became much more involved in the issues. I found out that he had been referring cultural resource crimes to BIA criminal investigators for years, but no one had been following up on his concerns. I took it, these concerns and a stack of letters and referrals to my manager and he agreed that it was a legitimate issue. He kindly told me that I was welcome to work on these issues if I worked on them on my days off because he had plenty of violent crime for me to work on. So thus began my 13 year journey from my days off or weekends off to what we have going now, which has been a wonderful, wonderful journey. The working on those cultural resource crimes for the next three years before I retired I met a wonderful group of people that I honestly had no idea existed. There were specialized law enforcement officers and agents working on these crimes, the archeologists, osteologists, and tribal historic preservation officers were a group of people I just didn't know about. I found this group of people extremely passionate about the issues and I was so happy to begin working with them in a much larger role after I retired from my law enforcement work. By then I had friends in high and low places around the country here, and I had much more time to devote to the issues. So with the encouragement of some friends, I incorporated a business, Lone Ranger Resources of Sholo, Arizona in 2013. And probably within 30 days, we had our first referral from a tribe about a particular looting incident. And since then, this group of people, the funding that accompanies our work has just snowballed over the past decade, making more friends, reaching out to more tribes, addressing the issues um, in the area. My field work primarily revolves around the White Mountain Apache, the Hopi tribe, and I'd say probably the Western half of the Navajo Nation, all places that I have lots of good contacts with people on the ground and we're in touch with their management all the time, that kind of stuff. Now, we have had numerous other projects, looting incidents, damage assessments, right? different things with numerous tribes in Arizona, but also across the Western United States. Montana, Idaho, California, Nevada, Alaska. Uh, that's why I accidentally mentioned Montana when I started out there. We, we really have covered a lot of country, have a, a great working group of people with all the tribes. And it, it's only gonna get bigger and better as more people find out what we're doing. They're welcome to lend a hand and the help goes back and forth both ways. Our goal in, in that respect really is putting a dollar figure on the damage assessments. There were some government entities, some groups doing that on occasion for lesser uh, incidents, but our working group, uh, Stacy and some of our other coworkers, that's really become our bread and butter. That's really what we, the end product, okay? But to get to that end product, we also wanna address education and prevention and training with all the people involved. Looting in Indian country is as complicated as this map. Dozens of tribes in Arizona alone have varying types and sizes of land bases and the density of the populations lends itself to huge and remote tracts of land. Law enforcement resources are limited 
law enforcement managers direct those limited resources to violent crime before property crime, which is how most people perceive looting and vandalism. They don't consider the cultural aspect. A lot of times law enforcement agencies just don't have time to track criminals across jurisdictional boundaries for what they perceive to be minor crimes or misdemeanor crimes. Those breakdowns in communication between tribal, state, and federal authorities are commonplace. And it takes a special kind of investigator to gather pieces of the puzzle months apart and sometimes years apart. We have investigations where it took us years to identify the suspects. In modern America, we're used to sitting down at the television and watching a crime scene show that might take an hour and it goes from investigation to DNA analysis to conviction to prison in 45 minutes while you're eating your popcorn. That's not how it works in the real world. People get very easily frustrated that they may call in some information or give a tip to law enforcement about some criminal activity, having no idea that that information may be absolutely critical. But it may be years until that case comes together because of the many things going on at the same time. And sometimes people in rural areas just have kind of a reluctance to become involved with the government or the criminal justice system. And they can very easily and understandably adopt kind of a live and let live attitude about their rural neighbors. Maybe they know that they're involved in looting. Maybe they know where there's a looted site. But they, they just choose not to become involved. Okay, very, very easy to understand that mentality, that lack of involvement. Now, you might ask yourselves, who are these looters and what motivates them? Well, Stacy put together a nice simple diagram, maybe help you understand it. And there could be more detail. We, we wanna keep it simple for our presentation. Probably at the bottom of the pyramid, if you will, are people, families, friends, associates who go out on a weekend for a picnic or a hike, maybe they're camping in an area where they either know there's an archeological site or maybe they come upon it accidentally, but they're basically focused on collecting artifacts in plain view on the surface, not necessarily digging or disturbing the site. Okay, so kind of a very limited involvement in the overall scheme. But they're, they're still stealing history. They're still stealing culture that does not belong to them. The next group above that, if you saw the movie Caddyshack back in the day, you remember the, the gophers or whatever they were tearing up the golf courses, have these big crater sized holes everywhere. You've prob Some of you may have seen or seen photographs of archeological sites that look like that. The drive for those people is usually some kind of get rich quick scheme where they think they're going to go out with a shovel and a lantern at night and sneak onto this property and dig up in a pot worth $80,000 or something like that. Okay. Now, of course, that doesn't happen very often, but they're, they're lured by that dream or by, the, by that idea. Now, experience tells us that a lot of those people are influenced by alcohol or illegal drug addictions and the issues that go with that. And then often those Caddyshack looters, they are working at the direction or the behest of the next level of looter, the professional looter. The professional looters have been at this many years. They have well-established network of friends and family that are out there looting that sites and bringing the artifacts to them for sale, really in interstate and sometimes international distribution. These people have a little different mentality. And sometimes we can think of them in the same vein, if you will, of big game poachers, 
illegal illegal timber cutters, that type of thing, where they're they're stealing a resource, a natural resource. So it's a, a resource crime. And those people have the same disregard for hunting regulation or timber regulation or ARPA regulation as those criminals do for other natural resources. Very easy for them to have uh, kind of an entitlement mentality. I think Stacy mentioned it. Um, and then we should not forget those at the top of the looting hierarchy. Those are the collectors who drive the market, providing the financial means and incentive that attract both the professional and the caddyshack type looters. Thank you, Dusty. With our ARPA assistance initiative, we have the opportunity to work around our four main goals, to prevent, detect, and respond to ARPA violations, and also to remediate the effects of this type of damage to prevent further loss. But to do this, we need to coordinate and create partnerships with tribal historic preservation offices, with federal agencies, and with tribal rangers, and really with all communities who share this desire to protect heritage sites. We also need to pull in our friends in the archaeological and geosciences so that they can help us boost our investigative capacity by finding innovative ways to look at the evidence. Since we began our ARPA initiative, we've responded to reports and conducted damage assessments on several reservations. We respond to damage caused by looters and vandals, but we also deal with damage that is from negligence. So somebody driving a backhoe where they shouldn't or digging a trench in an unauthorized areas. To implement remediation strategies, we work with agencies to identify ways to protect sites by preventing more trespassing for stabilization. And uh, one particularly uh, useful remediation strategy for petroglyphs is removing spray paint with a product called elephant snot. And that's a very successful way to remove that kind of damage. We have also partnered with our friends at Desert Archaeology to provide advanced uh, mapping services um, in preparation for major backfilling efforts. And we've participated in ARPA orientation trainings with tribal rangers and cultural resource specialists in several areas, providing me with the opportunity to meet some really wonderful and generous people. And this last year, we're very proud to say that we completed the guide to field investigations for ARPA violations. And that was a big effort to standardize our practices, offer the best recommendations, and to do that so that our methodologies will always stand up under scrutiny when, when they go to court. So we have this excellent team that keeps us going. And at Archaeology Southwest, here I work with John Welch and Shannon Cowell, both of whom you may have seen on the cafes these past few months. John, um, he leads several of our initiatives and he has a great gift for creating new partnerships and bringing different people together to get things done. And Shannon works with me on almost everything that, that I do. And um, she really just improves everything that we work on with her commitment to this. We have several consultants that we, we work with and we re rely on their expertise. And I also need to acknowledge Gary Cantley, BIA Western Regional Archaeologist. Gary's commitment to ending archaeological resource crime and to spreading out the training to, uh, to teach people how to respond to ARPA violations has made a real and serious impact in this region. So one of my roles when I go out on a damage assessment is to serve as lead archeologist. And during a damage assessment, Dusty's actually in charge or another tribal ranger. And I have to shift my mindset I am no longer working on an archeological site. I am working on a crime scene. 
And before I started doing this work, I never really thought about um, how archaeologists and tribal rangers could work together to help protect sites. But, at, and when I first went out to work on a crime scene, it seemed very foreign to me. Um, but what I quickly learned during my first training is that there are so many similarities between what we're supposed to do in an archaeological investigation and what we do during a damage assessment. So when archaeologists go out on a damage assessment, we're expected to identify the archaeological resource that is damaged and confirm that it is over 100 years old. We also have to read the dirt in the same type of way that we do during a dig because we have to identify the extent of the damage and we have to distinguish between old and new damage. We have to map and document the violation and we have to produce a jargon-free damage assessment report that can be used for prosecution. And we may even be called upon to provide expert witness testimony. But we have an obligation to do more than this. And this is when our work around the prevention aspect really comes in. And I know I'm echoing archeologists who came before me when I say that we need to let people know that looting and vandalism is a crime with serious consequences, that these acts are immoral and illegal, and that they are violating Native Americans' rights and religious beliefs. And I, and many others, believe that one of the most powerful ways to do this is to amplify Native American perspectives about the importance of ancestral places and how tangible aspects of the past preserve cultural identity. To this end, our team has funneled much of our effort um, in the outreach arena these past several months in working with a Native American owned marketing firm to create a public outreach campaign that our consultants immediately recognized needed to be a movement. It needs to be bigger than us. And this movement is just getting off the ground with the launch of a new website that um, is really only been on, it's been live for just a couple days now. And so, and actually, instead of talking to you about the website, I would like to very quickly take a spin through it so I can share our mission with you. So the website is savehistory.org. Um, I do want to take a minute to acknowledge the gentlemen who worked on our branding and logo and graphic designs. His name was Sean Kwani, and we only worked with him for a brief period, um, but he had a great reputation and he was a very talented person and he passed about a month ago. So our condolences extended to all who were friends and family of Sean's. The mission of this website is to raise awareness of archeological resource crime, but also to provide resources for people who wanna learn more. We do talk about what we do as a group, but again, this really isn't about us. This is about what these crimes do and who they're stealing from. So we intend to put more and more resources on here and we want people to know how they can get involved. We've created a tip line, 833 and loot. So people, if they think that they have seen uh, recent looting or vandalism and they want it to be investigated, they can call or text. There's also a way to submit a confidential tip through this website. And we've got a portal up here to submit a tip. But we also ask that people just learn and share and start conversations with family and friends about this issue. And we feature stories from tribal stewards. We do this in video format. And this is also, and you can also find this on our stories page here. So we want to feature a variety of perspectives on our blog and we want to share good news. We want this to be a platform for good news. So we want to talk about successful conservation projects, remediation projects, um, new funding or new partnerships that were made to protect sites, and then new legislation that's being introduced. And then we also ask people to subscribe. So at the bottom, 
we've got subscribe to our newsletter and we will have a monthly newsletter up and running. So please visit the site and please become a subscriber so you can follow what we're up to. And of course, we have a Facebook page, Save History, and we should have content loaded on that page soon. So please look for us. And I'm gonna hand it back over Dusty now to tell us from a ranger's perspective, what more can we do? That's great, Stacy. Thank you very much. Everyone, if you can't pick up on Stacy's enthusiasm, you need to fine tune your computer a little bit more. She is just a wonderful ball of energy to work with and has been for years and years. One of the observations I made over the years, coming to understand the scope, the broad scope of looting issues, there are so many people involved, both well-intended, honorable people and the nefarious criminals in so many jurisdictions that no one site steward or monitor or no single law enforcement officer or investigator can even comprehend it all, more or less influence it single-handedly. I would encourage all of you to have, to find, to make friends in high and low places. Now, we had a different world not very long ago in the pre-COVID thing, where we attended training here and there so that the, the manner in which we do that has all changed in the past year. We're all part of that big change. But the concept hasn't changed. The importance of making those friends and connections, building your network, building your death star, as I used to say, you, you just have to get out there and meet people. You have to work with those stakeholders, the tribal members, the tribal councils, the tribal historic preservation officers, the uniformed police officers, other investigators, tribal rangers, or conservation officers. And as I mentioned earlier, their management. And then in the scientific community, archeologists, osteologists, geologists, other specialists, and their management. You have to get all these people on the same page. We've jokingly called my job flying monkey management, or I like to refer to it as cat herding. It is a challenging job to get the cops and the archeologists to play nice and head in the same direction because the federal ARPA statute is very unique in that it requires law enforcement and archeologists to work hand in hand from the beginning of the incident all the way through the formal damage assessment. There is no other law, no other circumstance, no other crime that is spelled out in the statute like that. It's really a, a very close hand holding journey from beginning of the incident all the way to the damage assessment being filed and completed and used by prosecutors or civil attorneys. And ultimately, think about this. Think about the judge reading that damage assessment, considering your expertise, with whichever role you were in, and, and then applying or weighing that when he's considering the guilt or innocence of this person, or the jurors are kind of in that role too. And then when they're talking about what the penalty will be, you know, did we have some good cultural information and background that the judge can lean on, that the jury can understand. So the commingled training of all these professions is critical to developing friendships. You know, I think sometimes we don't live long enough to love and appreciate each other enough. 
in our younger years, we're raising families, we're trying to make a living, we're trying to make ends meet. We're very, very busy. As you get a little bit older, you get a little bit of a feel for how important all those relationships are, how all the motivated people can come together and build something. And I'm here to tell you, uh, Gary Cantley and I were kind of tilting at windmills for a long, long time here in the South, that, Southwest. Now we had good people, don't get me wrong. We had good people working with us and helping along the way. But after years and years of that, really through Gary's connections and friendships across the country, we were able to put together this package and take it to a, a renowned firm like Archaeology Southwest and convince them to give us some of their best people to make this thing go forward. We had the spark that would drive and motivate and spark us if we needed to get sparked to keep moving with all these projects. The past little over, oh gosh, I guess we're at the third year of our contract now, Stacy. It has been a rocket ship. It has been so challenging, so rewarding to work with all these good entities out there, the Arizona site stewards, all the organizations that we work with. Very, very rewarding. And I can't say any more, can't say any more good about the folks that we work with and encourage all of you out there in the audience. 160 some people across the nation. My phone is blowing up with text messages from my friends around the country giving me some good factual feedback and I'm sure there'll be more to come. This isn't a noble cause. Please go to that website. Please tickle your friends, get on board, help us and do your part. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Stacy, you wanna come on back in here? Thank you, Dusty, for all of those great words. And we want to take a moment also to thank our ARPA response team pictured here. Randy Ream, Mary Barger, John Welch, Gary Cantley, Shannon Cowell, and Bill Doley. And not pictured here is Mitch Kerr, who is also an important person. Uh, he's an osteologist, and he taught me a lot when I first started doing this, this work. And we also extend our gratitude to a lot of other people who continue to share their knowledge, resources, and passion to help stop looting and vandalism on tribal lands. Um, is it time for questions? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Great. <clears throat> we have a lot of really good ones. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so I will throw some questions at the two of you for 15 minutes or so. Hopefully we can um, get, get in deeper into some of these things. Um, let's see, let's see where to start. Um, have you been successful in engaging tribal members to serve as site stewards on, on tribal lands? Um, similar to the you know, federal and state land program? So we have not um, started or implemented a site stewards program on tribal lands. It is something that we think would be incredibly uh, useful and helpful and kind of a, uh, something that's always in the back of our mind for this initiative. D uh, Dusty has worked for the Arizona Site Stewards and he may have a few comments on that. That was an excellent question. Disappointingly not, but that doesn't stop us from working in that direction. I can tell you that, you know, the, the Arizona site steward program has been in place for years and years and years and years. And I'm sure they had some excellent founding people. I can tell you that the tribal historic preservation officers in this, this region, this part of the country, are just beginning to come on board with a lot of the things we're doing and as, or I think even more importantly, 
they're beginning to trust us, trust the work that we're doing, all, all the good things that come with that. In this past year, the COVID issues have been a very good example. Some of the tribal historic preservation folks who have a good understanding of what we are doing as far as uh, monitoring and prevention and education and training and that kind of stuff. The historic preservation officers went to their tribal councils and asked for and received exemptions for our employees to continue our work following the different CDC guidelines and so forth. So that those were some beautiful letters who gave us exemptions to continue the work safely because it's that important. Right. So that kind of friendship will will reap other benefits. That's great. There's a uh, there's a couple questions about um, the Safe History website, Stacy. Um, folk were sort of wondering: is it is it just focused on tribal lands, and is it just focused on the Four Corners area, or what is its geographical kind of focus? That's a good question. Um, from a geographical standpoint, we our work is focused generally in um, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, California. Um, but we do work outside of those states when needed. So we're really we're looking at the southwestern region mostly for the website, but it has the opportunity to grow. Um, and we are focused on tribal lands with the website. However, if somebody calls the tip line or sends in a report through the confidential form, um, that will get routed to the proper land manager if, if it turns out that that violation did not occur on tribal lands. I mean, ultimately, we want this to end everywhere. Mm -hmm. And we know that you know, the same people that are looting on tribal lands might also be looting um, on, on state lands, on federal lands. Um, so really what we need to do is to saturate this region with the message that this will no longer be tolerated. And that's what we're hoping once we get this campaign moving as, you know, the Safe History website is really serving as the foundation of that. And we really want to branch out from there. And, and yeah, and get everybody paying attention. There's no place for looters. Yeah. Um, I had a question from um, a student, an archeology span student um, says that I'm encouraged to participate in field schools. Is there an opportunity to participate in an ARPA type field school where we can learn about and help with this initiative? And I think that also sort of ties in with another question which just like how could we get more participation and relationships with you know young people and so that's a really good question and um it looks like dusty wants to say something but i'll just say real quick i don't know of any field schools specifically that focus on damage assessments um but we have the Archaeology Southwest University of Arizona, Upper Gila, Upper Gila Preservation Archaeology Field School. And Dusty has been there in the past speaking to our students. And I hope to be invited in the future to speak to the students. And what I would say also is to look for any opportunity to attend um, an ARPA training session. There are some opportunities that come along a couple times a year, or they did before all of the COVID restrictions. And sometimes I think they're offered on the weekends. So I would recommend looking for um, opportunities like that. And also um, tell your field school instructors, you wanna learn about this because this is important. We need more archeologists aware. I mean, even if they're not gonna work directly on um, damage assessments, we want all field archeologists to be aware of how to conduct themselves when they find themselves on a looted site. If you're on survey, you know, and you walk onto a recently looted site, you have the potential to contaminate forensic evidence. And 
few years back, I wouldn't have known not to pick something up if it was something a looter potentially left behind. So Dusty, did you have anything to add to that? Hey, that's all good stuff, Stacy. And great question, whoever threw that out there. Stacy, how about including a link on our website to the various trainings that we do become aware of? That might be a good thing. Um, mm. When you talk about training, there's kind of two avenues. You're, you're, the person in the audience is asking about the archeological side, but there's also the law enforcement side. And those two things have to come together. And really in the federal system, the archeologists and the agents do train together. Um, to, that's where your training is going to take you eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we have, you know, I'm going to throw this one at you, um, Dusty, um, if I can find it. There it is. Uh, Dusty, can you share a success story? Stacy and I had a good talk before this conference to say there's some things we can't talk about. Ah, okay. <laughs> but uh, I can tell you that there are amazing investigations going on that rival any Indiana Jones movie out there. Okay. So people just have to be patient. They have to help us and give us, give us the time and the professionalism to bring these cases together. Fair enough. Fair enough. A couple of people have asked, are there any kind, is there any kind of legal recourse for the intentional destruction of resources on private land, either by the owner or by another person? Is there anything that can be done about that beyond education, education, and education? No, you know, we live in a great country. We live in the golden age of America. And one thing that, that our country does that not all countries do in some countries, all those natural cultural resources belong to their government. Mm -hmm. They don't belong to the individuals. But when back in the day when this country was founded on the concept of owning your property, owning your land, including the mineral rights, what, what's yours is yours. Those, the laws that we work with now are designed to protect those resources on federal property, on public property. Mm -hmm. Private property is pretty much an open game, hard, hard, to, hard to deal with that. One thing I would mention, and I thought about this in the earlier question too, people forget that there can be civil penalties mm -hmm. associated with damage in an archeological site. Let's mm -hmm. say by a construction company or a utility company, something like that. Um, those are not always intentional, but sometimes they should have been following the regulations and the safeguards a little bit more effectively. And sometimes we have to take those big corporations to task and bite them and remind them that there are rules and laws and regulation in place to protect those sites. And I think tribal governments maybe sometimes aren't aware of that whole process where our damage assessment, even though it's a civil matter, can help the tribal government address those issues, you know, for that incident, but more importantly, into the future, it, could be, it becomes education and training for the tribal councils and for the construction companies, entities out there. And I just wanna mention real quick that burials on private lands are often protected by state laws. So we have in Arizona, we have the Arizona Antiquities Act and um, you cannot disturb burials on private land. Right, good point, Stacy. somebody. So, Stacy, one of the first questions we had was someone who asked what was the difference between um, ARPA and NAGPRA. So mm. that yeah. ties into what you're saying, correct? Well, think about the titles, those two acronyms. <laughs> ARPA is Archeological Resource Protection Act. NAGPRA is native, if I get it right, see if I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Native, Native American Graves Protection Act. I think, yeah. Um, so what we're talking about there are human remains and funerary objects, okay? So a little bit more specific. 
Now, dealing with those things, we don't have to prove that they came from public mm -hmm. land or, or Indian land. You, you can't deal in those at all. Mm -hmm. So a different, a little, a law addressing kind of a different slice of the pie, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yes, and ARPA is covering archaeological resources that are um, outside of funerary and sacred items and items of cultural patrimony. Right. So the, the main criteria is that it's um, over 100 years of age of archaeological interest um, and, yes, has the ability to tell us something about the past. Great. Would you say that looting is... Do you have any sense whether it's increasing, decreasing, staying the same over the years you've been at this? Um, you know, I, I think some of, some of what we've we've learned with this with this good fellowship we have going on and seeing it all from a lot of different angles is it's kind of episodal or cyclic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it seems to be very active, sometimes less active, but there are those of us in the circle, if you will, working on these uh, issues to tell you that it, it has not slowed down by any means when you look at the artifact sales on the internet. So I, I would say it has, hasn't, certainly hasn't slowed down, you know. Um, it's a difficult thing to quantify. Stacy said that very politely earlier because you have to have all these tribes who have their own resources, they have to come to the table and, and it's their discretion if they even wanna share what their resources are and what their issues are. And do they wanna you know, work together or do, you know, they have that sovereign discretion to, to run things how they wanna run them. That's why it's very important, it takes a lot of time to build those relationships mm -hmm. and, and get those people to trust your your operation and what you're doing. Um, what kind of response are you receiving from the US Attorney's Office or the U US Department of Justice in response to your efforts? Anything? I would say excellent assistance. Great. The US Attorney's Office is very much on board with what we're doing. Um, to, let's say, and now we're getting into things that Stacy and I have to be careful about talking about. Yeah. Our, our, our oversight, if you will, our cooperative oversight from the federal government is first class. Mm -hmm. They are on board with the things we are doing because in all honesty, no one is doing it we're, what we're doing. Nobody has built this Frankenstein that we built in the past few years. It's a lot of fun. When people find out what we're doing, they get excited. <laughs> um, quick question. Um, is, is your damage assessment, the, the protocol, is that something that's publicly available? Or is that just for... You know, it really is. There, there are some good uh, publications out there. And this brings up something I don't think we mentioned, Stacy. You talk about that. And Stacy's going to tell you how our team is literally writing the book as we speak on how how to effectively conduct these damage assessments. Mm -hmm. So yes, I did mention the the guide to field damage assessments, and um, right now it is only in circulation with a limited number of people. It is um, for federal land managers right now. Um, and we're, we had a very limited number of copies printed and we're already working to refine it. So it's been out for review. Um, so we don't have it to readily distribute. At kind, this kind, of, kind of in a peer review mode right now, but there are uh, regulations in the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations and the federal statutes. And I think the, um, is the Forest Service or the Park Service has a, a technical bulletin out there. It's pretty easy to find in a web search. Um, to it's give actually you... in the our, our extended content. It is um, the National Park Service bulletin. I believe it's okay, very good. 
and that kind of gives you the skeleton of a damage assessment, if you will. Great, yeah. Well, I guess we've been out in an hour, so we probably should wrap it up. But um, as thank you guys so much, there was there were many thanks in the questions and answers as well. There's a few we haven't gotten to, and um, like Stacy pointed out, there is extended content, and we're going to. We'll shoot all the questions um, to Stacy and Dusty, and if there are others that they can answer or would like to answer, um, we'll add those to the website. And then when the video is done and stuff, we'll also shoot out an email to everybody so that you know there's, if your question didn't get answered, um, we may still do it. It just might have to be on um, online later. So, um, wow, thank you so much, you guys. And I asked Bill to come back and sort of wrap us up, but that was really fascinating. I was really, thank I you. appreciated learning more about what y'all are up to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Folks, you were gonna learn something new about uh, Archaeology Southwest Preservation Archaeology Mission tonight. So hopefully uh, you did. And uh, thank you, Dusty and, and Stacy, for a wonderful presentation. And it's only uh, four weeks away until we do this again. And <clears throat> on March 2nd, the first Tuesday of the month of March, Karen Schollmeyer who's a preservation archeologist here, and uh, Scott Ingram, uh, assistant professor at uh, Colorado College, are gonna be coming in to talk about, should we stay or should we go? Farming and climate change in the era circa 1000 to 1450 uh, CE. So they're gonna be looking at what farmers do to, in response to, to climate change and uh, share some of their examples from both uh, Central Arizona and Southwestern New Mexico. So we look forward to seeing you again. And uh, thanks for coming together and, and joining us tonight.